That sounds that sounds great. Thank you for doing that. And I have quick time going, but already I can hear my my fan running. So at some point I might just end the quick time on my side, just in case it like on your end you can hear the fan and it clouds uh, right. up your okay. voice. If, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing. Of course. This. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> and um, I guess what. I was thinking we could do um, is we could maybe start with some of the things that um, that Susan had sent in an email in terms of the list of questions, but then we can digress or just focus on the things that seem most interesting and relevant to your own work. If sure. that sounds good, yeah, that sounds great. And I think I think you had asked in an email, but I think I forgot to answer the question of what to do with the stuff we've recorded. Yes, um, and I know David. So I'll, I'll write David, so he might not have sent out the links, but um, he was going to create a Google Drive folder because he has like 100 gigs of space in his university account. Okay. Um, so we should be able to just upload stuff to that box for sharing. Okay, that sounds good. Awesome. Okay. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe a good way of starting is um, if you could – talk a little bit about your web text. I know we had talked a bit about it at Four Cs, like how it came about and how you even decided to submit it to Kairos, but um, it would be really awesome if maybe you could contextualize it and, and talk a bit about um, the process of creating and submitting it. Sure. So so the project was, um, it began very much as a personal project. I, um, the interview I originally conducted with my grandmother um, I conducted with no intentions of, first of all, no intentions of ever using the audio, um, but but it basically was a personal project that I um, had done right before I moved to Pittsburgh uh, to start my PhD, and, um, you know, I was kind of leaving home and leaving my family. I, I'd not really been there for a few years, but it was, um, I was kind of, you know, back in town for a bit in the summer before leaving, and my um, grandmother was sick, and I had been doing work in oral history in the past. Um, with uh, some like community-based oral history work um, during my master's degree, and so I had um, taken that and done some interviews with my grandfather as well, and so I thought um, it was a great opportunity to interview my grandma. Um, and then, fast forward a bit, <laughs> um, I showed up at University of Pittsburgh, and honestly, I didn't really know much about <laughs> the field of composition at that time, or um, really have any idea what I was getting myself into and um, I had a class my first semester which was um, a multimodal composition class and <clears throat> I definitely never heard the word multimodal before and I was you know it was very new to me everything I'd never made a website before you know I'd done a little bit of work with um, kind of video projects and things in the past but not a lot of um, audio specifically and um, anyway it just sort of seemed like an interesting opportunity to um, take up some of the threads that I had of things that I had been working on before coming to grad school and, and continue working with them. And I had this material, and so, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going to, like, call my grandma and see what she thinks. And <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, of course, she her first response was, well, you can do that. I'm not sure why anyone would want to hear this, you know, like this kind of, like, um, you hear that a lot in oral history, actually, like, you know, the, the idea of people not being sure why their story would be of interest to anyone. And, you know, of course, she's my grandma, and I think everything she says is really cool and interesting, <laughs> you know, so, so um, you know, she gave me the sort of go-ahead to, to do what I wanted um, uh, to use it for some kind of, I just told her it was going to be like some kind of online project, and I didn't know what it was. And so, and it definitely through that class sort of, um, grew from, originally I, um, I was just working with um, the audio recording and I did some experiments with the audio and then I started playing around with some <clears throat> eight millimeter um, film that we'd had and, and had digitized and so, um, and then that kind of culminated, I guess, in that, in the little video piece that was part of, like the first part of the process I was working on. And then um, as I started doing more web stuff, I started thinking like, okay, how, like, the idea of, you know, whether, how to actually, uh, I guess the whole thing was driven by constraints in one sense, um, thinking about, first of all, the constraints of telling, you know, of her sitting down and telling me her whole life story in two or three hours, and then trying to figure out what could I do with that that would be satisfying, partially also the fact that it was within the scope of this class that I was doing, et cetera. So, um, and so I was kind of working with a lot of those complexities, and, and I'd come from a background in, um, 
uh, community-based and, and like critical and feminist oral history. And so I was thinking a lot, I already had a lot of, um, I was very well versed in, in these questions of representation and what it means to um, use other people's voices, both metaphorically and um, materially to um, kind of represent their stories. And so, um, so I was just thinking, what, what could I do with that in a, in a web context? And partially, I think it was a really great thing that I had absolutely no idea how to build a website until I started working on that project because every piece of it became like a little puzzle to work out. And so I basically, I'm like, okay, this would be interesting. Would it be possible to do this? And then I'd have to go through and look and figure out, okay, how do I make a horizontally scrolling website? And I figured that out. And then how do you make it have no scroll bars? And, and like all of that was very much like resisting the, um, best practices in the web. There's no reason you would want to have a horizontally scrolling website with no scroll bars. Uh, <laughs> like I was finding these forums and they were like, no, don't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, would I really want to? So anyway, like I think in some ways, like not really having a sense of what the rules were allowed me to figure out how to break them um, in some interesting ways. And, and the actual, you know, the, the architecture of the site isn't particularly... I mean, it was, it was advanced for me at the time, but it's basically HTML, CSS, and then some jQuery libraries to make the animation kind of function. Um, and uh, it was kind of amazing what, to figure out what I could actually do with these very minimal skills that I had and that I've now since that time kind of built on. So I guess the, the project for me kind of launched me into a lot of uh, work in, in the area of digital and multimodal and um, composing and, and writing and things. And I had no idea that I was ever going to do that. So it was a really nice launch pad for me. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's how the project kind of came about. And then, uh, so I finished the project over the course of this semester. I'm thinking, in hindsight, I'm thinking back, like, I remember being on an airplane going, was I going back? I was flying back to Seattle <clears throat> for my grandfather's funeral, actually. He had died over um, Thanksgiving, my, my grandmother's husband. Um, and um, I'm on the airplane just, you know, with all of these muddled feelings about everything and going to see my family and, um, like, tracing out some of the connections between different audio pieces and the, um, in order to make the connections between the hyperlinks and everything and listening to these things and editing clips on the airplane and stuff. So it was a very, um, you know, condensed process where I, like, threw my whole, threw everything really into, into that project over the course of a semester and then... Um, at the end, you know, I submitted it for my class and I posted it. all of the work that we did was posted on the web. And um, <clears throat> I think it was a week after I put it up on the web, um, I got a, an email from Cheryl Ball. And I was like, from Cheryl Ball, you know, <laughs> very excited. Like, this is my first semester in this program. I've just learned what Kairos is, you know. Um, and she had happened upon it through seeing... Um, an article, or, or not an article, a review I had written of an article that she had written um, and posted on my website and then kind of came to the project and, and invited me to submit it. So it was, uh, I guess, in a lot of ways speaks to the, um, the wonders of the web for, you know, finding an audience. And, and um, I honestly never would have, maybe not never, but at that moment, I wouldn't have thought to um, submit it to Kairos because I was just very new in, in the field and kind of finding my footing. But it was a very exciting kind of uh, springboard for me and, and led me to all the things I've kind of done thereafter. So wow. that's really, that's really cool. <laughs> um, just in terms of the process <laughs> and how that came about. And I'm wondering too, um, what was your timeline like? So it was published in 2011. And so how long was the process from when you had composed it um, for class versus like it actually appearing live and going out into the world through Kairos? So I, I fin so that was the fall semester of 2009 um, that I was working on the project. And I finished it. Um, I finished a version of the project, which didn't include the, the written piece, the essay, um, but had the rest of um, mostly it was it was the video and the the interactive piece of it. Um, and then I think 
over, well, and then I had my second semester of being a first year PhD student and I was very busy taking classes and everything. And so I, I think I waited until uh, the summer and I wrote that essay and uh, submitted it with the essay and then did um, a revision of it. And then it came out the following spring. So, um, you know, it was, it was a good, well, let's see. I think it was, um, you know, around a little over a year after I finished it, it, it came out. Um, but incidentally, like the, so I, I had just finished it and um, the first time I ever presented it at a conference, and this was actually built into the project, I think, now that I'm thinking of it, but the first time I presented this project, and it was like the first conference I had ever gone to as well as this like graduate student conference at um, University of Cincinnati, I think, and there was, um, I had, my this again I'm, this is all wrapped up in all of these personal family things but my <clears throat> my grandmother had just died and I had just been gone back to um Seattle to try to see her but when she wasn't doing so well and then of course as soon as I left um she passed away and um I so I was just back in um uh, in Pittsburgh and then go to this conference and like the conference was either the I think it might have been the day before or the day after her memorial service and it was just this very interesting thing where I was thinking about the different audiences that the project has, because here I am showing it to, you know, whoever showed up to this graduate student conference, grad students from there and around, and, and <clears throat> some faculty. And um, at, kind of at the same time, my family was showing it around to other people, um, you know, to people in my family, to my grandma's friends, and just kind of picturing it there. You know, I wasn't able to go to her memorial in the end because I'd just been there the week before. Um, but it was, like, a really interesting... Um, I don't know, it made me feel really good that, that uh, I could have some sort of presence there and, and you know, people responded. Um, of course, it, people in my family love it. It's, you know, it's like this um, this record of, that otherwise they would never have, so. That's like, and that's really super fascinating to you just in terms of how audience like really proliferated as the project went on and that family became is like such a vital part of the audience. And I remember there was a section in your web text where um, it was under the um, sort of how to read part where you have the theory laid out and then you have the interactivity kind of laid out. And so you talk about audience as being a kind of co-authority or the, the ideas around constructing meaning and co-constructing narratives. And so um, I'm curious to like, how did, how did that then change, like, over the life of the project, this idea of co-construction? Because you also have credited yourself, your grandmother, and then there's another person, I think, an archivist who's credited too. <laughs> My dad. Really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so my, it's funny, like, uh, well, I guess two parts. You just asked a couple of different questions. So um, the first thing about uh, co-construction and this idea that, you know, part of the purpose of the project is for people to kind of participate in making meaning from all of these different anecdotes and, and kind of incomplete fragments of stories that they can then experience in different relationships with one another and kind of try to pull out the meaning from the, like the spaces between them. So there's this idea. Um, and I think in some ways, when I think about the different audiences who can approach this, you know, my family is a very privileged audience in a lot of ways because they, they know how these things connect to each other and they have a sense of, you know, how the, you know, the story of my Uncle Mike getting chased by bees fits in with this, you know, story of camping or, you know, there, there are all these ways that, um, that they have this, um, a very different kind of relationship to it. And in some ways, the whole fragmented nature of it isn't all that probably important to them you know it's just this is a collection of grandma's memories and we understand how they fit into this sort of larger um, framework um, so that was one thing that I've just been thinking about that and and you know they don't I don't know how many of them have gone through and read the actual uh, written piece of this and the essay and the kind of thinking about the um, the method and the how it fits into you know, conversations around oral history and documentary and these kinds of things, but I didn't write that for them. So I mean